Welcome to AC Part 2, Review Lecture 8.3. We are going to be talking about alternating series circuits, resistors, inductors, and capacitors in AC circuits. Of course, we're going to put all those together and to make a RLC series circuit. We're going to talk about resonance, impedance, and reactance. Okay, this is a bit of a review. If you've already um, done this material, you can basically skip over it. I'm going to go over that because it's already done on, on previous slides and we covered it in class. So just to remind you that it's here, it's maybe just for your use. Okay. All right. Now, of course, we're going to talk about power and alternating circuit current circuits or AC circuits. And this is basically the power company really wants to sell you power, right? Because obviously, Power times time is energy, and that's what they charge you for. It's kilowatt hours. Now, the instantaneous rate at which re energy is dissipated in a resistor can be written, of course, is I squared R. Power equals I squared R. Now, but we don't have a constant current like we do in, an AC, in a DC circuit. Instead, we have to use our formula, I equals the sine of omega dt minus V. And of course, we're going to square that for the current and then times the resistance to give us the power. Now, it's a little bit more complicated because it's no longer a constant. Okay, so it's a sine wave, but we can pull the sine wave outside of the current. Okay, so we can we can split that up. And what we're interested in is the effect, the energy that gets dissipated in the resistor. It's going to turn out that all of the energy in an AC circuit is basically dissipated in the resistor. We don't only care about the heating effect. All a resistor does, it doesn't care what direction the current's going. All I care, all it does is change electrical energy into heat energy. So what we want to do is to figure out a way of, of making it an AC, kind of like a DC, so it's either easier to analyze, but we have a comp complication because this maximum current only occurs for a very small amount of time. And But we have one complete cycle, and what we're going to do, when you do something like this that varies, what do you do? You make an average out of it. Uh, but the problem with that is it's a sine wave, okay? So you look here, and you have a sine. The average of this, you can just by just putting these, you know, these putting on top of each other, you can see that it's going to be zero. Whoops, we got a problem. Okay, but this is squared here. If you square this wave, you wind up with this one. If you square a negative, it becomes positive. So in other words, all that happens is the sine wave moves up here. It goes from positive one to zero, and the average is exactly equal to one half. And you can see that by just sort of taking this part of this area here, you can see it kind of folds onto that, right? You kind of see that, right? So in other words, the average of any sine squared is one half. So then we can rewrite the power as I squared R divided by two. We're just substituting in there. And of course, we're gonna pull this in here and make this look like the I squared R we saw before in DC. In order to do that, we need I over the square root of two. So that's how, where that comes from. And that is gonna be called the root mean square. And you can see where that is. Root mean stands for average square. Okay, of course, we're gonna square it. This is otherwise known as the RMS current. So IRMS is the peak over the square root of two. And then we can say that the power is the equivalent power is the RMS value squared times R. So it may it turns the AC into sort of a quasi DC. Okay, it's the equivalent to what it would be in DC. And this can be used for alternating voltages, EMFs, and currents. Okay. So anytime you have a peak, if you want the RMS. Okay, this, of course, the peak is the amplitude. You divide it by the square root of 2. Or you can multiply it by 0 0.707. 1 over the square root of 2 is 0 0.707. Of course, the square root of 2 is 1.4. The RMS value of anything is the peak divided by square root of 2. So in a series RLC circuit, the average power of the generator is equal to the production of the thermal energy in the resistor and how much heat is the resistor is producing. And of course, we have the RMS values. And now we have a problem here. We have other elements in the circuit. You okay, might have resistors or inductors, and there may be phase lags or leads in there. So we got to put a power factor in here to make it like a resistance, even though we don't have a pure resistance. Okay, we still, so what we want to do is we want to come up with something. We want the equivalent of V equals IR. We had an Ohm's law. So we want, to, we want something that we can figure out what the I is and E is, and we have, need something that get that Ohm's law type feel. So we're going to call, we're going to make the, the resistance part of this, we're going to, the, the so-called resistance, okay, the equivalent resistance. We're going to call that an impedance, okay? And it sort of sounds like, like a resistance. It kind of impedes, right? So we're going to say that R, the RMS current equals the RMS voltage divided by this impedance, okay? 
So it's sort of like I equals V over, over R. Then we can say, we can say the power is the RMS current squared times resistance, or the, the RMS voltage divided by the impedance times the current times the resistance. It's just the algebra. And then we can say that the voltage, the RMS voltage times the current uh, times R over Z equals the power. And now we've figured out what the cosine phi, this power term should be, this power factor term should be. It's R over Z. Now, whenever you talk about alternating currents or voltages, if it's me measured with a meter, it's probably an RMS value. When we did the Ohm's Law light lab, the Ohm light, law, light lab, remember that one? We used Variax. Variax, we were using AC. And we were using light bulbs, old-fashioned light bulbs, because they're pure DC. Okay, now we can get away with that because the meters we use measured the RMS value. And of course, when it's a pure resistance, this term is one. And we'll later see out why that is. So this means if any any time when they say, you know, 120 volts at 60 hertz, that's probably the RMS value. The peak value, by the way, for 120 volts is 170. So you can now you can use the DC, the old-fashioned DC equations we got way back in one of the previous chapter. We can we can now reuse them, which makes it convenient. So on average, all of the power, all of the energy in an RLC circuit is in, basically dissipated in the resistor. Okay, so the resistor is the only power dissipating part of a series RLC circuit. There are no power losses with a pure with a pure capacitance or a pure inductor. So what happens in a capacitor? During part of the cycle, the capacitor is storing energy, and then the cycle reverses or goes on, and now everything's going in the opposite direction. So that means the capacitor is giving up the energy that it stored. Overall, what it gave up is what it takes back so that nothing goes on. In an inductor, the source will push against the back EMF in the inductor and then store the energy in the magnetic field of the inductor. But when the current begins to decrease, the inductor says, I don't like that, so it returns that energy back to the circuit. So basically what's going on, as the capacitor is storing energy, the, ener the inductor is giving it up. As the inductor is, is storing energy, the capacitor is giving it up. So they basically go, they slosh back and forth. Okay, the energy in those two sloshes back and forth. The only thing, place where energy gets converted or used is in the resistor. So the resistor is the only energy dissipating device in a series RLC circuit. So... Power is RMS EMF, the RMS voltage times the RMS current times this power factor. The power factor includes the phase part of this equation. Now, some, some applications use capacitors to shift the phase. Most of you look at most loads in your house. The biggest load in your house, probably the refrigerator, the motor in the refrigerator, the compressor in the refrigerator. If you have a well, it'll be when that's running, it'll be the well pump, okay? If you're an air conditioner, It'll be the air conditioner, okay? It might be the fan in the, in the furnace. Motors, okay? Motors are basically inductors. And motors are basically larger loads than the small capacitive loads like in your cell phone charger or your TV. So, and power companies don't like it when this cosine factor is anything but, but one. Okay, this, power companies want this to be one because that maximizes this. You can see what goes on here. If this is one, then power is just V times I. If this is zero, the power company isn't selling you anything. So they're not making any money. Okay, since most loads, large loads on a power grid are inductive, what they do is they put capacitors in there to shift it back toward one. Because they want to get the power maximized. And that occurs at resonance. That occurs when the inductive reactance equals the capacitive reactance. And this happens when the driving frequency equals the natural frequency of the circuit. Now, you got to be careful with the power factor. If you look at your calculator, okay, you take the cosine, put your calculator in degrees, takes the cosine of any angle in degrees, and you'll you get a number. If you take the cosine of the negative of the angle, you'll get the same number. So you cannot use the power factor to determine the sign of the phase where the circuit is inductive or capacitive. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, so you gotta remember that cosine phi is equal to cosine minus phi. Okay, so you can't use the, the power factor to determine what you've got here. Of course, the power company wants to have this power factor equal to one because it's resonant because this maximizes power. 
And as I say, most of the loads in a large grid are inductive motors and transformers. There are transformers everywhere in a power grid and lots of motors. The power companies place capacitors throughout their distribution system to counteract the inductance and to get the power factor close to unity as possible and the circuit as close to resonance as possible. We'll later have an example. Now, if the cosine, if the power factor is zero, then you either have a purely inductive or purely capacitive load, and then a, the power is zero. So it's like an open circuit, and power companies don't want open circuits because they're, they're not making any money. Now, we can also use resonance for tuning out undesirable frequencies of electromagnetic radiation in favor of narrow band of desirable ones. This is how the old-fashioned TV and radio tuners work. It's also used in filters too, electromagnetic filters. Okay, so we can express power as a function of frequency in our RLC circuit, and you wind up with this fairly complicated expression. And of course, the RMS value squared times the resistance times the omega squared, that's a natural frequency of the circuit, divided by this quantity here, R squared omega squared plus L squared times the quantity omega squared minus omega D squared. So when you have resonance, this term disappears, these two terms cancel out, okay? And you, this omega squared cancels out. And you wind up with the RMS value squared, the voltage RMS squared divided by the resistance. Like the DC, V squared over R. And power companies want this, okay? They don't want this part of this. And this, by the way, this is called a resonance curve. We'll have a more complicated one later that you definitely want to put in your notes. Here, of course, is when the, the circuit's being driven at its natural frequency. And you can notice that you wind up with, you know, depends mainly on the resistance in the circuit. As the resistance of the circuit decreases, actually it's just like DC, as the resistance of the circuit decreases, the power increases. So does the current. So here's this one that you definitely want to put in your notes. Okay, so here's what they call a resonance curve. On this axis, on the y-axis, is the amplitude of the current in the circuit. And this is a ratio between the driving frequency and the natural frequency of the circuit. When the driving frequency equals the natural frequency of the circuit, you, you're at resonance. And of course, you can write this like this if you wish. And notice here, down at this side, you're below resonance. This is the low frequency side. This is what they call the capacitive side of this, of this resonance curve. The capacitive reactance is high. The inductive reactance is low. So the capacitive reactance is greater than the inductive reactance. In other words, you're below the point at which the capacitive reactance equals the inductive reactance. Okay. There's, so this means the capacitance is low, the inductance is low, the frequency and the omega are both low. As you get to the extremes toward DC, the capacitive reactance has a tendency to go to infinity. So it acts the capacitor acts like an open circuit. The inductor the inductive reactance goes towards zero, okay? So the inductor acts like a short circuit, okay? And you can see that from looking at the equations for the inductive, the capacitive and inductive reactance. On this other side, which is the high frequency side, okay, you are above the natural frequency. And this is what we call the inductive circuit. It's more inductive than capacitive. And the way I like to remember this is induction, inductors hate change. High frequency means that you're trying to make them change more often. So they fight that, okay? As this goes up, that goes up. So they develop a destructive reactance is what I meant to say. It also means so that the inductance is high, the capacitance is high, the frequency and the omega are both high, okay? So XL is greater than XC. If you take this to extreme, the inductive reactance, and of course, make the frequency as high as possible, the driving frequency as high as possible, the inductor reactance goes to infinity, the capacitive reactance goes to zero. Now, if you notice along here, these are the curves, okay? They fall off on either side of resonance, okay? They also depend upon the resist resistance in the circuit. And at, at resonance, basically all of the reactance is due to the resistance. Okay, so we're gonna have an example. We have a series, dri a driven RLC series circuit. We're gonna talk about power factor and average factors. And it, we have a, a generator of 120 volts, and that, of course, will be the EMS at a 60 hertz. And a, and a problem might just say we have a generator of 120 volts, 60 hertz. That would be the RMS value. This is the, the frequency, the driving frequency. 
And of course, we have a resistance of 200 ohms. Okay, we're going to be easy on you. We didn't bother to list the, reduct the inductance. We just gave the reactants of XL equals 80 ohms. Capacitive reactance of XC is 150 ohms. And they're asking, what is the power factor, cosine phi, and the phase constant phi, and the RMS current of the, cur of the circuit? They also want to know what is the average power that, it, that is dissipated in the circuit. And of course, since it's all dissipated in the resistance, that's where, where it's all going. And how could we get this to resonance, provided the other parameters of the circuit are not changed? And you should have done this at home before the lecture. OK, so this is the series RLC AC circuit. And the first thing you want to do when doing homework problems is always look for knowns and unknowns. So you would write down your resistances. And of course, you want to make sure that you have everything in SI units, because if you don't, you're going to really mess yourself up. So list everything, OK? And of course, with the units on it and what you want to know. This, will, this is sort of your roadmap for this, your plan of action. Then the next thing you do is you look up all the formulas, OK? So you write those down. You have your cosine factor here. Your power factor here is R over Z. Here's your formula for the impedance. Okay, the square root of the sum of the squares. Here, of course, is your I squared R loss. And of course, it's going to be RMS value here. Again, here is the Ohm's law version for poor AC. Current is the voltage divided by, the, in, by Z. Okay, and of course, then here is our formulas with capacitive reactants. And we had to convert that from Hertz to radians per second. Okay, at this point, we're going to start putting things together. We want to know the power factors. One of the things they ask for, that's just equal to R over Z. Here's our R, and of course, this is the formula for Z, the square root of the sum of the squares. At this point, we're regular, regular, ready to put our numbers in. Putting the units on everything will help keep you straight. Okay. Notice that these units have to cancel out completely. And it turns out the cosine of phi is 0.944. That's fairly close to resonance. Not perfect, but it's fairly close to resonance. And if you take the inverse cosine of that, you end up with 19.3 degrees. Now, at this point, we can't tell whether it's positive or negative. But if we look back over here, this is 150 ohms. If we go back to this, okay, XC is greater than XL. So XC was 150, XL was 180. So XC is greater than XL. So you were on this side of the circuit. Okay, that means the angle is less than zero. It's negative and the circuit is capacitive. And this means the current leads voltage. Okay, now we can plug some more numbers in. We know that P equals I squared R, or E or RMS over Z times R, V squared over, V squared over Z, V over Z, excuse me, squared times R. So we plug in everything, we wind up with the RMS voltage squared times the resistance divided by this quantity R squared plus quantity XL minus XC squared. We can plug our numbers in. Our, our RMS value for the for the voltage is 120 volts. Don't forget to square it. 200 ohms for the resistance. Here, resistance again, XL minus XC, quantity squared. And that power is 64.1 watts. Okay, that's what the generator is producing, and that's being dissipated solely in the resistance. The RMS current is going to be the power divided by the square of the power divided by the resistance. We plug those numbers in. It's 554 milliamps. Okay, now we want resonance, okay? That was the rest of the solution. And we want XL and XC to be the same. We want them both to be 80 ohms. And we know that XC is one over mega DC. So we want, this will give us our new capacitance. So we plug in everything here. And of course, this is what we want for our, our capacitive reactants. It ends up being 33.2 microfarads. The old capacitance with this old reactance was 17.7 microfarads. The difference between them will be what you will want to put in that circuit. And you could either replace it. Uh, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to replace it, it's easy to replace it. You replace this one with that one. But a lot of times, you know, you don't want to bother replacing something. You just want to put something else in there. The good thing about capacitors, capacitors they add in parallel. So all we'd have to do is add a suitable capacitor in parallel. And the, the one we want to add would be the difference between these two values. And that's the lovely thing about this. So it's much easier to add something in than it is to break the circuit. And, okay, so you can just add something in parallel. OK, transformers. Transformers are basically two inductors, 
sharing a common magnetic field. So they had two coils of wire. They usually wind them around a common core of iron to make sure that, they, that the magnetic flux is, is kept inside the coils. And we connect them to two sides. Of course, this is the primary side, so it's designated by the subscript P. And the voltage source across here from the primary will be VP, the number of turns. That's how many loops there are in this coil or how many coils there are in this coil. We designate it by NP. Okay, that's the number of turns in the primary. The other side is connected to the load. The load is represented by pure resistance. And that coil will have NS turns, the number of turns in the secondary. And there'll be a voltage across that will be equal to the voltage of the secondary. And what is the core for? The core is to keep the magnetic flux inside the coils so it doesn't leak out. And this provides a medium for the flux to pass from one coil to the other with a minimum of leakage. Now, if you take on a, a transformer apart and look at this iron core, it ends up being a bunch of thin layers of iron that are basically glued together with a non-conducting glue. And what they do there, remember the eddy current demonstration we had before? Yeah. This is, the, I, if you got varying voltages here, you're going to have eddy currents everywhere in this. But by breaking this up, okay, and putting something that is a, a, a resistor between them, okay, an insulator between them, it breaks up those eddy currents. So that you don't end up with the losses and the transformer core doesn't heat up. Okay, now in this class, we're going to assume an ideal transformer, and we're going to basically assume purely resistive loads. And an ideal transformer is one in which it does not have any energy losses, and that means the power input will equal the power output, okay? Now, typical real transformers have power efficiencies of 90% to more than 99%, because obviously the power company doesn't want to waste any of its, of its precious energy heating up its transformers. Okay, so we can use the Faraday's law and the Lenz's law. Again, we're putting an AC current in here, okay? AC voltage across this. So we can write the Faraday's law as minus, this is mainly just to remind us that it's always gonna oppose us. The number of turns in the primary times the time rate of change of the flux in the coil. That's what this part means, okay? The secondary coil has the same Formula, the only thing you're doing here is substituting for the voltage across the secondary and the number of turns in the secondary. Now, with a well-designed transformer with a good iron core in it, these time-varying quantities will be the same because they will share the flux. will be the same. There's no flux loss. Then what we can do is eliminate d b dt, and end up with the transform equation. It is the number of turns in the primary divided by the number of turns in secondary equals the voltage in the primary divided by the voltage in secondary. There are three basic types of transformers. One is a step-up transformer. Step-up refers to the voltage as you go through the transformer. If you go from the, second, from the primary to the secondary side, the voltage will increase. So when the number of turns in the secondary is greater than the number of turns in the primary, the voltage in the secondary will be greater than the voltage in the primary, that's what's pictured here, okay? This is called a step-up transformer. You might have 120 volts coming in and maybe 1,200 coming out. That would be a, they would have, and maybe you got 100 turns in the primary. You'd then have 1,000 turns, 10 times as many in the secondary, okay? 1,200 coming out, 120 going in, that's 10. Okay, another type of transformer is the step-down transformer. And that's where, where you have a lower voltage coming out than going in. And then you have the number of secondary turns in secondary is less than the number of turns in the primary. And then the voltage in secondary is less than the voltage in the primary. So maybe you got 120 volts coming in and you have only 12 volts going out, okay? So what you're going to have, you might have 100 turns in the primary. You'd have only 10 turns in the secondary, okay? 10 to one. Okay, now you can, there's a, now, the book doesn't cover this, but there's a third type of, of transformer called an isolation transformer. And that is when the number of turns in the secondary equals the number of turns in the primary. Well, that means the voltage in the secondary and the voltage in the primary are, are the same. That's useless. No, it isn't. Why? Because these can be used to isolate separate parts of the circuit from dirty power input. So, and remember, transformers don't pass DC. 
So you haven't happened to have an input voltage and maybe has an AC component with a DC component. Depending on how you wire that up, you can either send only the DC to the rest of the circuit and shunt the AC to ground where it, dis where it goes away, or you can get rid of the DC component and send only the AC to the rest of the circuit. Those are called isolation transforms. Now, for an ideal transformer, there's no energy loss. So the power input equals the power output. So we can write that as IPVP equals ISVS. And then, of course, we want to relate this to the original transformer equation, which is a turns ratio. Number of turns in primary divided by number of turns in secondary is the voltage in primary divided by the voltage in secondary. By the way, this is not a typo. It also equals the number of the current in the secondary divided by the current of the primary. It's not a mistake. That's actually the way it's supposed to be. Okay, now if you're looking at the load from the primary side, you can also determine the equivalent resistance of the load. So the equivalent resistance of the load is the resistance at this end, this R here, times this ratio squared, primary to secondary turns squared. So then we can say the number of turns of the primary divided by the number of turns of secondary squared will give us the equivalent resistance divided by the original, by the load resistance. And that is useful in this task because you want, may want to rat, match resistances between the primary circuit and the load. Because if you do that, you end up with a maximum power transfer between this power source and the low resistance. And this is used in stereo and antenna terminology. It's called impedance matching. Now, transformers depend on the Faraday Lentz law, so they do not transform or pass DC or any other non-varying input. So this makes them very good for filtering out unwanted dirty power. You may see these in, in uh, surge protectors and things like that. If you wire it up one way, only the AC gets through. If you wire it up another way, only the DC gets through. Okay, here's an example of an ideal transformer, an equa a calculation. We're going to talk about turns ratio, average power, and RMS currents. We have a transformer on a utility pole. It operates at a primary voltage of 8.5 kilovolts. That's an SI. You have to convert that to SI on the primary side. It supplies electrical energy to a number of nearby houses, 120 volts. And both of these, of course, are going to be RMS values, unless they tell you otherwise, okay? Or unless the, the thing has a sign in it, okay? The quantity you're given has a sign in it. It's probably going to be RMS values. And anything you meet, read with a meter is going to probably be RMS. Okay, so we're going to assume an ideal step-down step down transformer. How do we know a step-down? Well, this is the lower end, okay? The prior, the the... You, this is the primary, that's the secondary, and since this is greater than that, it's a step down. Okay, we're going to have a purely resistive load, and we're going to have a power factor of unity because the resistive load is purely resistive. We're going to have an average rate of energy consumption or dissipated in the houses. Okay, the resistance is in the houses. It's going to be 78 kilowatts. And we want to know what's the turns ratio, primary to secondary of this transformer, what are the RMS currents in the primary to secondary. What is the resistive load in the secondary circuit? And what is the corresponding resistive load as seen from the primary circuit? Now, you should have worked this at home before lecture, before viewing this video. The physics of this is a transformer. The first thing you do is write down your knows and unknown, unknowns and unknowns and convert them to SI units. And so you write everything down. And you also write down what you want to know. And then you start picking formulas. Okay, And this is a transformer formula. Since we're dealing with RMS values and ideal circuits, uh, unity power factors, we can also say that the power, the average power is current times voltage. And we can also say it's V squared over R. You can only use these formulas. Okay, we left the cosine, the power factors off of them because we assumed it was ideal and purely resistive. At this point, you want to start plugging numbers in. So you take the number of turns in the primary divided by the number of turns in the secondary. We'll equal the voltage ratio between the primary and secondary. You have 8,500 volts divided by 120 volts. That's a 71 to 1. So this means there are many more turns in the primary than there are in the secondary, which makes sense. It's a step-down transformer. The power is the current times the voltage. So we're going to solve that for the current. That will be the power divided by the voltage. The current in the secondary is going to be the power. And since it's ideal transformer, the power on both sides is the same. Divided by the voltage in the secondary. And ditto for this. Only All you're doing is changing this little subscript. So at this point, we can find the current in the secondary will be the power, which is the 78,000 watts, divided 120 volts, a big fat 650 amps. So that's going to be a nice, big, thick wire. 
if you were carrying this much all in one place. So, okay, so that's gonna be on the output side of the transformer. On the primary side, the current is only 9.2 amps. And remember the I squared R loss, okay? Yeah, this is why power companies don't wanna have high currents in their lines, because otherwise you get prohibitively high I squared R losses, it just heats up the lines. Okay, so then the power is gonna be V squared over R, and we need to know the resistance to be V squared over P. For the secondary side, it's gonna be Vs squared over P. For the primary side, correspondingly Vp squared over P. So the secondary side is 120 volts. We still have the same power. So 0.18 ohms or 180 milliohms. Notice on the primary side, it's a lot more, 930 ohms. Okay, now these checkpoints you should answer at home before we do the lecture so you get the maximum benefit out. Okay, what is the voltage? We have a light bulb here connected to two transformers, and we have 120 volts coming in. So we want to know what is the voltage across the light bulb. Well, the first thing you want to do is count the turns ratio. You've got 120 volts coming in. You've got two turns coming on. You've got four turns coming out. Two turns in, four turns out. Two to one. Twice as much voltage here as you have here. So this is 240 here. Here we have four turns at the input side of this transformer, two turns on the output side. So 240, this will be stepped down by two to one, so it'll be 120. So this is kind of like what the power company does. Okay, they step it up, transmit over very long distances, very low current, high voltage, and then step it back down so it's safe. 120 volts. And here is, of course, the explanation of that, in case you missed it. Okay, we have another, the same thing we had before. We have one amp in here. Now there's several different ways you can do this. You can use the the ratio of the turns to the, the currents, okay, in each one of these, remembering that they're inverted. Okay, number of turns in the primary divided by the number of turns in secondary with the current in the secondary divided by the current in the primary. But since you already know this, you have one amp times 240 volts. That is 240 watts. And that has to be the same as the, since these are ideal, it has to be the same power here. So 120 volts, well, if you have two amps here, two amps times 120 volts will equal 240 watts. So the answer to this should be two amps. Okay, and by the way, it's also two amps over here. Okay, six volt batteries connected to one side of a transformer. Compared to the voltage drop across coil A, what is the voltage across B? Now a battery is a DC source. It doesn't vary. There's only one time when a battery varies, and that is when you're either connecting it or disconnecting it. In a minute, I'll tell you a funny story about that. We'll help you remember this forever. Okay, so the answer to this, this is not varying. As long as it's not varying, the, the, the uh, coil doesn't react. Okay, because coils only work if there's a time varying component of either the potential across them or the current that's going through them. And since that doesn't happen, this is going to read zero. Okay, now my brother was, we replaced a four to six foot long fluorescent light fixture when I was a child, replaced, replaced it in our, in our basement. It was over the ping pong table and the tool table, you know, the workbench. And my brother, of course, knew this was a transformer. And, uh, you know, fluorescent tubes, especially fluorescent tubes that large, have a pretty high voltage requirement to get them to fire. So I have 120 volts coming in and maybe you got 1200 coming out. You know, that's a 10 to one ratio. So my brother wanted that ballast in the worst possible way. A ballast is just a big transformer. So my father and I gave it to him. And we noticed a few minutes later, he found an old partially discharged dead D cell battery that you know wouldn't even light up a flashlight. I later measured the potential across it with one volt. And my brother's holding on, connects the ballast Okay, one end of the ballast, the input end of the ballast to the to the battery. And this end, he was trying to get a spark off of it, you know, by shorting this out. And he wasn't getting anything. He's getting increasingly frustrated. <laughs> but he's still holding on to the battery. Okay, he made the mistake of holding on to this end. And then he slipped on the battery. And of course, that interrupted the circuit and the this is two coils. Both of these said, I don't like this change. Developed a back EMF. And of course, it was like 10 to 1. 
<laughs> or more than that, much more than that. And we could actually hear the current building up. Ow! My father and I, you know, my my immediate response to this, well, Dave learned about inductance. You know, yeah. and I'm yelling that across the, 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 the basement saying, well, now you learn that it does inductance and it's not work on DC. So remember that, okay? Don't fall for this as a test question. You connect it up to DC. While you're connecting it, yes, you can get something out. You can get a heck of a lot of stuff out. It also happen while you're disconnecting it. But when it's steady state, nothing happens. Transformers don't work with DC unless you're interrupted. Okay, now which one of the following choices will reduce the amplitude in an LRC series AC circuit? There's only one possible choice here. The only thing you can possibly do here is increase the circuit resistance. Obviously, increasing the MF is gonna increase the amplitude in the circuit. And you don't know what size of resonance you're on. If you're on one side of resonance, this might work. If you're on the other side, it won't. If you're on the other side of resonance, you've got just the opposite problem. One will work and one won't. So the only thing you can do is increase the circuit resistance because you need to increase the impedance. You don't know whether it's resonance or not, so you don't know how the reactances are gonna change. So the only thing you can do is basically increase the circuit resistance. Okay, capacitors connected to an alternating circuit in AC supply. Assume there's no inductance or resistance in the circuit of the capacitors replaced with another that has a larger capacitance. What is the effect on the RMS circuit in the, in the, in the RMS current and the capacitive reactants? Okay, so there's no inductance or resistance. The only thing you have is a capacitor. Okay, so the capacitance basically is one over X, one over omega C. So what is gonna happen here is the RMS circuit will increase as the capacitive reactance decreases. And the way you see that is the current is gonna be the voltage divided by the reactance, okay? The capacitive reactance is one over omega DC. You plug that in here, okay? Since it's one over, one over, it's gonna wind up on top. So the RMS current is now the voltage times omega DC, okay? So the current will increase as the capacitive reactance decreases. We have five identical capacitors connected in three different circuits as shown. The AC current source in each circuit is the same. In which circuit is the RMS current the largest and in which is the RMS current the smallest? Now, this is a single capacitor. What I always do with this is I basically assume they're all one ferret capacitors. These are connected in series. Capacitors go as one over in series. So this will be effectively one half the capacitance of this. So if this is a one ferrocapacitor, capacitor, this is going to be a one half ferrocapacitor. capacitor. They add in parallel. Okay, so in this case, this will be effectively a two ferrocapacitor. capacitor. So this one will have the largest RMS current and this one will have the smallest one. So what's going to happen here, if we notice the RMS, is the, the RMS voltage divided by the reactants. And of course that just means V times omega D times C. And so what you wanna do is you wanna have the one with the largest capacitance, effective capacitive, will have the smallest, excuse me, have the largest RMS current by just looking at this. So that this one would have the biggest one, series would have the smallest one, and this one, the original one would be intermediate. Okay, four circuits are set up so each contains an AC source and an inductor. Circuit A is a 50 hertz and a 15 millihenry inductor. Circuit B is 60 hertz and 10 millihenry. Circuit C is 100 hertz and 2 millihenry. And circuit D is 50 hertz and 4 millihenry. Rank these in orders from largest to smallest. Whenever I do come across something like this, the first thing I do is look at the units. They're all hertz and millihenrys. Okay, the next thing I do as I look at this, something like this, I'm gonna rank something. First thing that pops into my mind, make a table out of it and write down everything you know. Okay, so we know that XL is two pi FL and everything's given in terms of frequency. The two pi is gonna be the same for all of these things. So XL is proportional to the frequency times the inductance. And the units are all in Hertz and all in micro Henry. So we don't have to worry about converting everything times 10 to the minus six because they're all the same. Okay, so we make ourselves a table. We have A is frequency and inductance. And then we multiply this times this. And the units on this is the weird unit, the mixed units, or microhenry, 
times hertz. So 750. We do the same for all of these. This one, 600 times 10 is 600. These are 100 times 2 is 200, and 50 times 4 is 200. Becomes very easy to spot them. They want it for small, from largest to smallest. Okay, so it's A is greater than B is greater than C equals D. So it would be answer B. So that's how you handle a question like this. An inductor, an inductive circuit operates at a frequency of 120 hertz. The peak voltage is 120 volts. The peak current through the inductor is 2 amps. What is the inductance? Okay, now they're both peak values. The first thing you want to do is check that. Somebody can give you sneaky things and give you an RMS value, one RMS and one peak, but you know you use the square root of two to convert. But since they both did them in peak, we can relate them directly. Okay, and then we can say the peak value of the voltage is going to be the peak value of the current times the inductive reactance. The inductive reactance is just 2 pi F times L, okay? And then we want L, L will be the voltage, in this case okay, so it'll be the peak, divided the peak current times 2 pi F. At this point, we plug in our numbers, being very careful to put a bracket around these to make sure that's absolutely clear. It's 80 millihenries. So the answer to that is B. If you got B, you got this correct. Okay, the graph shows a current as a function of time for an electrical device plugged to an outlet with an RMS voltage 120 volts. What is the resistance of the device? Okay. It's very difficult to, you can you could pick something else, but the easiest thing to read off of this chart is the peak. We know the peak current is 10 amps, and we can convert voltage, RMS voltage, to peak. It just involves multiplying by the square root of 2, or 1.41. And you might want to remember 120 volts RMS is 170 volts peak. Then what we want to do is relate it, okay, using Ohm's law. AC version of Ohm's law, and we know that V equals IR, so R equals V over I. And since we have a peak current here, we're going to use the peak voltage there. And it ends up being 170 volts divided by, by 10 amps is 17 ohms. The other thing you could do is convert this peak current to our RMS value, and then use the RMS value there, and use the same relationship. Either one will work, and you should get the same answer and when you do this on homework, you should do it both ways to make absolutely sure you, you know what you're doing. Okay, a circuit contains an AC voltage source, a resistor, and another component. The voltage amplitude is held constant as the frequency is increased. The current in the circuit is observed to increase as the frequency is increased. What is the additional component of the circuit? Okay, so they say the voltage amplitude is held constant as the frequency is increased, and the current in the circuit is observed to increase as the frequency is increased. So let's go back up. Okay, so they said the frequency is increasing, so you're going to the right on this chart, and the current is increasing, so you're going up this side of the chart. Okay, so this means it is a capacitive circuit. So XC is greater than XL. So remember, you're over on this side of the chart. It's a capacitor. The other way you can think of this is capacitors like an, like an, act like an open switch at low frequency and like a short at high frequency. As the frequency increases, the reactance decreases. So this means the current increases. If a resistor and incandescent bulb, there would be no effect at all because an incandescent bulb is a pure resistance and so is a resistor. If it was an inductor, the current would decrease as the frequency increased because the inductors act like open circuits at high frequency. Or you go back and do the curve like I showed you before. Okay, this is a weird circuit. I've always wanted to build this one. A circuit contains an inductor, a capacitor, and a light bulb connected as shown. All right, so look at here. Here's the light bulbs and a capacitor connected in series with a light bulb, and then here's an inductor connected in parallel with this. In which frequency limit is the light bulb the brightest? Okay, now what you got to think of, capacitors love high frequency. They act like a short circuit when the frequency is high. So when the frequency is high, this is going to act like a short, and the light bulb will light. At the same time, the inductor will say, I don't want to change. I'm going to act like an open circuit. So what's going to happen is the inductive reactance is going to be very high, and that means there'll be very little current in this side. Okay, so all the current's going to go through the light bulb, and the frequent it'll be the high frequency limit. So that's because the capacitor acts like a short at high frequency, while the inductor acts like an open. So most of the current will flow through the capacitor, and the bulb will, will light up at high frequency. So it makes a good detector for frequency. Cheap and dirty detector. 
Okay, an AC adapter for a laptop computer contains a transformer. The input of the adapter is 120 volts from an AC wall outlet. The output from the transformer is 20 volts. What is the ratio of output to input turns? Okay, now, you're going to have, a, you have 120 volts coming in, you have 20 volts going out. There, that means you have six turns at the input for every one turn at the output. Where do I get the six to one? 120 divided by 20. Okay, so this means you have six turns input for one turn output, so that's one sixth or 0.17. And we can see that from the turns ratio. Okay, resistor and inductor and a capacitor are connected in series with a voltage source of V equals V naught times the sine of 2 pi Ft. And this, of course, is the instantaneous value. Here's the peak. Which one, and by the way, that's how you recognize this. Which one of the following statements concerning this circuit is false? The current through each of the circuit elements must be the same. Okay, they're connected in series, so that one's true. So we can knock that one right out. The sum of the instantaneous potential differences at any time t across each of the circuits must be equal to this. Okay, the current through at least one of the elements is equal to I of t equals V0 divided by Z. Okay, and actually that would be true. Okay, because that's the current anywhere in the circuit. The impedance of circuit is equal to the square root of this. That one's incorrect. Oh, no, wait a minute. Okay, it has a resistor. No, that's incorrect. Okay, so this one's probably the false one. The voltage of one of the elements has a different phase angle than what, that of the other two elements. That's true because if it has an inductor, that's going to be 180 degrees out of phase with a capacitor. And, of course, the instantaneous ones, this is a connected in series. So all the instantaneous values of the voltages, I forgot to say that, all the instantaneous values of the voltages have to add up. Okay, the false one is this because the formula was incorrect. Okay, it did not have this R. They said there was a resistor in here. If there wasn't a resistor in here, then that would have been true. Okay, thank you very much for listening. If you missed anything, please rerun the video. If you have any questions, please email me. Thank you very much.